Hello everyone and welcome virtually to the Refugee Study Centre at the Oxford Department of International Development. My name is Catherine Brillick and I'm Associate Professor of International Human Rights and Refugee Law here at the RSC. It is my great privilege to chair today's seminar on the right to a nationality, a seminar that is a first for the RSC in two ways. First, in this event, we are with the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, launching resolution number two of 23 on the protection of the rights to a nationality. And second, as you can see and hear, this event is taking place in English and Spanish simultaneously, enabling us to make connections between academics, scholars, legal representation, uh, those involved in legal representation and many others in a range of countries and regions. Now, as you'll know, nationality is the legal bond between a person and a given state. Despite the safeguards granted by the applications of principles of use soli or use sanguinis, there are many examples of individuals and groups in the Americas who are either unable to acquire or effectively enjoy their nationality. Reasons for statelessness, whether legally or in practice, include situations where persons are arbitrarily deprived of their nationality on discriminatory grounds, laws that impose discriminatory requirements, often between men and women, regarding how nationality can be transmitted to children, and the implementation of measures which prevent the return of nationals to their countries. This resolution provides important guidelines for states in the region, providing a comprehensive, effective, and lasting response to guarantee the right to a nationality and to prevent, reduce, and eradicate statelessness. We are absolutely delighted to be discussing this resolution today with Commissioner Andrea Pochak, Rapporteur on the Rights of Migrants with the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. Andrea is a lawyer and activist, specialist in human rights law from the Republic of Argentina with extensive experience in the Inter-American human rights system. Dr. Laura Van Vass is founder and co-director of the Institute on Statelessness and Inclusion. And Jose Cibert is a Brazilian lawyer and Senior Protection Officer covering South America with UNHCR's Regional Office in Panama. We could not have a more expert panel to be discussing this resolution with you today. Thank you and over to you, Commissioner. Good afternoon, good morning. Can you hear me well? Thanks for arranging this important webinar. For me, it's very important to share the presentation of this very important resolution of the Inter-American Commission of last year. I took office as commissioner and human mobility rapporteur two months ago. So the merits or the success of this resolution is not mine, is uh, of my colleagues who were before me in the commission. And I would like to thank the work team of the rapporteurship who are here today. I would like to greet Catherine, Laura, and Jose. And I also would like to thank the OACHR for their support to the rapporteurship on human mobility. I'd like to continue with the next uh, slide. My presentation will have four parts. First, we will explain the mandate of the ICHR and uh, the rapporteurship of human mobility in particular. After that, we will be discussing the main challenges or obstacles with regard to the protection to the right to nationality and the, and the duty to reduce and eradicate statelessness. After that, we will explain the resolution 223 of the ICHR. That's why we're here today. And finally, I will present some, fin some final considerations. The Inter-American Commission organizes its mandate based on, I don't think that's the slide, based on the OAS charter, that is article 206, the Institute of the ICHR and the American Convention. Those are the funding documents. And the duty is to promote the observance and defense of human rights. This 
implies making recommendations to OES state members. And the second function of the Inter-American Commission is to be a consulting body of the OES in this mandate. So we work together with the political bodies of the OES, the Inter-American Commission and the Rapporteurship on Human Mobility work based on a wide and flexible regulatory framework. This includes the American Convention on Human Rights, which establishes the principle of non-discrimination and equality, Article 20 of the American Convention, that is about the right to nationality, and Article 27 of the American Convention, which is very important since it establishes that even though there is a state of exception, the right to nationality should always prevail. And also we have the essential framework of the Inter-American Commission, that is the American Declaration. And this is very important because several state members of the OS have not ratified the American Convention, but um, they do apply and they uh, follow the American Declaration. Article 29 of the of the declaration talks about the right to nationality. Also, we have the Convention of 1954 and 22 of the 35 countries that are part of the OAS have ratified this document. And also we have the Convention to reduce the number of cases of statelessness from mm -hmm. 1961, which was ratified by 18 states of the OES. The Inter-American Commission additionally has developed um, norms that are not legally binding because those are soft law norms, but they help understand and interpret legally binding norms. I am talking about the Inter-American Principles on Human Rights of All Persons, or Migrant Persons, Stateless Persons, and Refugees. And also we have a resolution on um, human trafficking, that is a resolution uh, from 2019, which establishes that the right to a nationality is a non-derogable right. And another sub-law norm that is very important developed by the Inter-American Commission is the resolution that we are presenting today, that is resolution 223 about the protection to the right to nationality. So what are the challenges when it comes to protecting the right to nationality? Let's continue to with the next slide. The challenges, this is the right slide. So the challenges that uh, the commission has noted uh, in recent times are the following. First, the commission has noted that the situations of statelessness in the Americas are exceptional because of the application of the use soli, uh, soli and use some principles in most of OAS member states. However, Situations of a statelessness and risk of a statelessness are identified in the region. And these situations that do occur or these risk situations are due to the lack of a nationality. And this has effects on the most basic capacities of human beings to develop their social life and access to rights. That lack of a nationality limits the possibilities of accessing basic rights related to having a nationality and possessing an ID document in the countries of origin, destination, or in the host country. The Inter-American Commission, as part of its monitoring rule, has noted, for example, uh, during a hearing that was held last week within the framework of the period of sessions of the Inter-American Commission, um, they have noted that 
in Uruguay, there is a risk of statelessness that affects those legal citizens that are not considered nationals by naturalization. According to the constitutional laws, sometimes these uh, people have no access to legal citizenship and this difference between the legal citizenship and the nationality can create situations of statelessness. The commission also, uh, thanks to its monitoring activities in the Americas, have identified some laws that maintain differences between men and women in the acquisition of nationality. And that is the case of Barbados or the case of Bahamas. There are constitutions that establish differences between men and women when it comes to the acquisition of nationality or to transfer nationality to their children. It's not the same if you are a woman or a man that's in Barbados or Bahamas. The Inter-American Commission, as part of its monitoring task, has noted in some countries that face extreme situations of authoritarianism, like Nicaragua, that there is an arbitrary deprivation of nationality through judicial or government decisions. The most important case is the case of Nicaragua. In February 2023, more than 200 people that were Nicaraguan political prisoners were arbit arbitrarily, arbit arbitrarily deprived of their nationality, and then they were expelled to the United States. Also in the Dem Dominican Republic, there is a well-known ruling. And the result of that ruling a considerable number of persons were deprived of uh, Dominican nationality and they were rendered stateless. Um, another uh, situation that the commission monitors is the lack of universal birth registration. For example, children born to foreign fathers or mothers, especially in, uh, in an irregular situation in territories other than those of origin or nationality and they lack an ID card. Uh, for example, we have the case of Venezuela. The commission has observed that persons living in Venezuela face several barriers to accessing valid identity documents, such as excessive delays, corruption, and high prices. This uh, problematic situation exposes them to irregular migration status in the host countries. And since they don't have a regular migration status, the exercise of the right to nationality is also hindered. And this leads to situations of statelessness. Daughters and sons of persons coming from Venezuela cannot have equal access to nationality. And therefore they're also exposed to statelessness. The commission also identifies situations in which there is a prohibition uh, to return to their country, or country of origin. That is the case of Cuba. Cubans have reported before the IACHR that some people are not being allowed to return to their country if they leave. And they end up being in an irregular migratory situation and they face a risk of a statelessness. In addition, the commission has identified a regional issue that there is no data about statelessness in the continent. There are only partial, partial data about the number of stateless persons on the continent and therefore there is a significant underreporting of stateless persons, and this also hinders the adoption of effective public policies. The Commission has also identified that there is a lack of adoption and implementation of procedures in the domestic law of the countries. 
only eight states in the region, in the Americas, have procedures for determining statelessness. These countries are Mexico, Brazil, Costa Rica, Ecuador, Argentina, Paraguay, Uruguay, Panama, and more recently, Colombia. This lack of legislative measures internally violates a principle of the Inter-American system, which is established in Article 2 of the American Convention. That is that the states should adapt their domestic legislation to international standards. And together with the lack of adaptation of their domestic legislation, there is also a lack of a gender perspective and differentiated approaches to protection for women and other groups at a special risk, such as mm -hmm. children and adolescents, LGBTI persons, indigenous peoples, persons with disabilities, and older persons. Because of all these regional situations that we've been monitoring, the Inter-American Commission, with the support of the OECHR, last year decided to issue this resolution, that is resolution 2 slash 23, which is the result of the observations and the monitoring work uh, conducted by the IECHR in recent years. The resolution is available in English and in Spanish is divided into four sections. First, there is an introduction which presents the context of the protection of the right to nationality. Then there is a very important section about relevant thematic definitions. And some concepts are clarified. Then it includes a part on the principles and also it includes a part with considerations and a resolution part. I would like to say that this resolution includes definitions that are important regarding the concept of nationality. And considering the hearing about uh, Uruguay last week, that's a very important concept because some states believe that nationality is something which is not. Sometimes they recognize nationality when there is no nationality or vice versa. Also, the Inter-American Commission determines two types of modalities to acquire nationality. There are automatic modes of acquiring, acquiring nationality. That's the case of Mexico, which uh, amended its constitution. And now it establishes that those born abroad who are children of Mexican parents or of a Mexican mother or a, of a Mexican father will also be Mexicans by birth but there are also non-automatic modalities of acquiring nationality, such as the case of Bahamas. Also, the commission mentions concepts that are very important that should be differentiated. That is the renunciation of nationality, the loss of nationality, that is something different, or the arbitrary deprivation of nationality, which is something different. In the case of the renunciation of nationality, which is a right, persons have the right to resign their nationality. And that decision should be voluntary, but also their decision cannot lead to a statelessness. That right should be volunteer, voluntary and it should not lead to situations of a statelessness. As I said before, the commission establishes the difference between the loss of nationality and the arbitrary deprivation of nationality. It also defines the concept of statelessness, and it also establishes a difference between uh, stateless persons and those persons at risk of statelessness. And which is very important for many of our countries, the commission establishes the definition of families, that is those children, born of unknown parents that were found abandoned within the territory of a state. The Inter-American Commission establishes that it should be alleged that those children were born in the territory of the state where they were found. This is very important in Europe, but also we have migration flows in the Americas. 
and we should consider the migration of children in that situation. Also, we have the part of the considerations with all the antecedents of the Inter-American system. And uh, let's focus now on the part about the resolutions. The resolutions part includes the main principles in the matter. We have the principle of equality and non-discrimination that includes differentiated and intersectional approaches, and that the principle that governs the Inter-American system and the universal system is the pro-person principle. That is, people should be at the center when it comes to protection measures. Also, there are some aspects related to the right uh, to nationality and which the goals should be when it comes to the right to a nationality. Also, it's about the ways of acquiring or losing a nationality. And also, it establishes the obligations of the states when it comes to the prohibition of the arbitrary deprivation of nationality. I won't provide detailed information about them because that would be too much, but the Commission also establishes precise obligations that states have to prevent, reduce, and eradicate statelessness. Sorry. For example, it identifies the need to have records to establish differentiated deadlines um, and differentiated measures for birth records. So the commission establishes precise recommendations that should guide public policies. Finally, it also establishes different measures to ensure the due process that need to exist in terms of the protection of the right to nationality. These are guarantees that complement the specific standards existing in the inter-American system to due process in each one of the processes in general. These are the protections and as well as complementarity with the inter-American principles in terms of human rights of all migrants issued in 2019. Finally, the Commission establishes through this resolution the need to set the way towards advancing in this topic, not just to um, issue this resolution, but to enshrine in this the work that the rapporteurship has been conducting in terms of the protection of the right to nationality and the prevention, reduction, and eradication of forced statelessness. It also calls for the work of the different states to work towards this goal and each one of its aims. It also requests each one of the states to collaborate and provide technical advice as well as contributing towards working in this legal framework. For example, the countries can advance towards the recording and identifying people who have a stateless uh, status in terms of determining the um, state surrounding statelessness, as well as ensuring the prioritization of access to nationalities, in particular in cases in which specific procedures have already been determined um, and initiated. Unfortunately, we don't have much time to keep going in this presentation. This is a job that has to be done at a community level, international community level. We need to recall the importance of the different mechanisms that are in place to protect this right. And we also need to strengthen the strategic alliances between the protection mechanism as well as our academic centers in order to strengthen and emphasize the importance of these principles and as well as strengthening the protection mechanisms towards human rights. I am available for any questions. I apologize in advance for any um, delays and I would like to thank this opportunity to be part of this seminar. Thank you. Thank you so much, Commissioner.
If you have questions, we'll be able to take them in English or in Spanish. Please type them into the Q&A box, which you can see on the screen before you. Now over to you, Dr. Van Vass. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm delighted to be part of this webinar today and to see the resolution celebrated in this way um, and have the opportunity to discuss it. Um, I thought that what might be useful for me to contribute to this conversation is a little bit of wider global context in which this resolution sits and um, gives some explanation as to why it's really very welcome at this time. Um, to kick us off, maybe it's worth trying to go back in our minds around 100 years, um, because almost exactly a century ago, the first case was ever brought before an international tribunal asking the question of whether states had complete freedom to determine their own rules for the regulation of nationality. And at that time, uh, 1923, so 101 years ago, uh, there were no international rules that provided protections to individuals, um, that provided specific parameters in which states could um, grant nationality or restrictions on the loss of nationality. And so I think it's important to recognize how far international law has progressed since that time. And in particular, I would say, although you can trace the origins of these international standards to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948, to the two UN statelessness conventions, to regional and international human rights treaties, I think what has been really exciting in the development of international and regional norms is what's happened over the last 20 or so years. And the reason for that is that increasingly people are testing whether these norms and standards are actually working. And one of the ways in which we see that is cases being brought before the courts, first at domestic level and then brought up also to the regional and, and international levels. And one of the parts of the world where we've seen this be particularly uh, exciting is in the Americas. So it's important to acknowledge the work also of the Inter-American Court on Human Rights, and of course the Commission's long-standing work on these issues. And what has happened over the last 20 or so years is that this idea that nationality is a human right has been tested in lots of different ways and in lots of different contexts. So if everyone has the right to a nationality, in what context and how do we protect a child from being left stateless? Can you just take away someone's nationality? Um, do people have access to nationality regardless of sex, regardless of the migration status of the parents? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So lots of questions have come forward through which we've gained a better understanding of what the right to nationality actually means. And the reason why this resolution is so interesting is it does a really sophisticated uh, and expansive job of bringing together all of these things that we've learned about how the right to nationality actually needs to be implemented in practice. And uh, as we've heard already from Commissioner Pochak, um, it's influenced very much by the experience of nationality issues and of statelessness in the Americas region. So you can see the uh, types of situation that have come up in the Americas the resolution provides an answer really for how states should be dealing with those situations. But, and this is why for someone who works at a, at a global level, it does so in a way that also enriches our understanding of these standards also globally. And I would say that the, the one characteristic of the resolution that is really important to emphasize again is the way it brings together this reaffirmation of the core human rights principles that we have to apply to our understanding of nationality and statelessness. So it reasserts this expansive idea of the prohibition of discrimination. It reasserts that the best interests of the child is paramount. It talks about this pro-person principle. 
And then it takes these principles and it shows through very concrete, practical guidance. Well, what does it mean to apply a principle like that in a situation like a mixed migratory context or a situation where a birth hasn't been recorded according to the usual rules or within the usual time frame? So it it goes beyond a sort of a setting of um, an ideal rule or standard, but it applies uh, very practical guidance to how how to do that. And in some places, it does so actually in a way um, that probably provides the most exciting articulation of what needs to happen. Um, so, for example, I'll just give you one example. I'm reading from the English text, um, which I hope is, you know, uh, comes across also from the Spanish. But in dealing with a situation where a child would otherwise be stateless, and deciding whether you need to grant nationality. The resolution is very simple. It says very clearly, if there is no certainty that the child would not be stateless, the state has an obligation to grant nationality automatically to avoid statelessness. Now that seems maybe like um, the trivial language, but it's so critical, the wording in which this guidance is provided if there's no certainty that the child has a nationality, you need to provide nationality and then act from there. It places the person at the center, it places the best interest of the child at the front of the issue. So let me end by just saying a few words about why this is important now. Um, there are a number of things happening at a global and at a regional level, also in other parts of the world, that make this resolution particularly timely. So, for example, there is a process underway at the UN Human Rights Council, prompted by a resolution adopted in June last year on the right to nationality, to elaborate further guidance at the UN level. And there will be an expert workshop taking place in two months' time to talk about uh, sort of strengthening UN level guidance. This resolution provides magical ingredients for a conversation like that. So it's come at just the right time. Um, I'm sure we'll hear more about this from the speaker from UNHCR shortly, but there is also a point of transition this year from UNHCR's I Belong campaign into the global alliance to end statelessness. This is a much more collaborative form of action in which different stakeholders can all play a stronger part. And so this is a way in which also the commission can come in and share its work, share its learnings with other parts of the world. And finally, I would say that there is a growing need and also interest to engage on this issue globally. Um, the challenges are larger than they've ever been in the past, but the um, impatience to mobilize and particularly to use the law to address these issues, that appetite is also greater than ever. Um, I'm just back from the World Conference on Statelessness last week in Malaysia, which was the largest ever global convening on this issue. And a very significant number of the sessions were talking about how do we use the law through paralegal assistance, through strategic, strategic litigation, through law clinics, through sharing of good practice. How do we make all of this actually work for people so that stateless people enjoy protection and the right to nationality is protected? Um, so I hope very much that the Commission will continue to engage on the topic and will help to see the resolution brought into action, not just in the region, but also helping to inspire conversations in other parts of the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Van Vass. And I think that point about the inter-American system providing guidance for a global community of scholars and others working on statelessness is really important. Um, I'm now going to share my screen so that we can see uh, Jose Suber's presentation. Over Thank to you, you uh... Jose. Thank you very much, Professor Catherine. And I have to say that uh, it is not an easy task to uh, be able to present uh, after Commissioner po uh, Poshak, after my uh, uh, colleague, uh, Dr. Lara Wan uh, was, but uh, let me try and uh, share, um, try to complement and share uh, some of the perspective uh, of UNHCR uh, 
uh, operations uh, in uh, the Americas. Um, we can move on to, to, to the next slide. Uh, we can move on. I think that Commissioner Poshak has uh, shared with us a quite detailed uh, briefing and uh, here. Uh, I think that uh, uh, the resolution uh, is, is quite an amazing instrument as it has managed to capture what uh, Dr. Laura has mentioned as how far international law has progressed. In this case, I think the resolution uh, com compiles uh, such progress we have observed in the Americas in the last uh, 10 years. This, of course, is something that uh, when we refer to the last 10 years, falls under chapter six of the Brazil Plan of Action adopted back in 2014, which is uh, came to an end in December uh, 2023. We will talk about what comes next in a few uh, minutes. But when we look at uh, the Brazil Plan of Action, when we look at what has been done in the region under its chapter six uh, on, erad on eradicating uh, statelessness, I think it's important uh, first to point that uh, we now have um, Argentina, Brazil, Costa Rica, Colombia, Ecuador, Mexico, Panama, Paraguay, and Uruguay uh, as uh, states that have adopted domestic uh, administrative procedures to uh, determine uh, whether someone uh, is or not a stateless person, and therefore ensuring, guaranteeing uh, the regime of rights uh, defined by international law and also uh, now reinforced uh, by uh, the uh, uh, resolution. I think that in a world, in a global uh, scene where I believe, uh, Dr. Laura, you probably know better, but I think in the whole world, I think we're talking around 20 to 21 states that have adopted uh, domestic procedures, having nine of those 20, 21 uh, in the Americas uh, is something that uh, should not be uh, underestimated as the potential we have in the region to be able to convince uh, other states to uh, do uh, the same. Also in relation to uh, something that the resolution points to, uh, the resolution encourages um, uh, accession and a ratification of uh, treaties. Uh, so uh, especially the 1954 convention relating to the status of stateless persons, the 1961 convention on the reduction of uh, statelessness in Latin America, as we speak today, uh, 17 uh, states are parties to the 1954 uh, convention relating to the status of uh, stateless uh, persons, while uh, 15 states are parties to the 1961 convention. Out of these, Argentina, Belize, Chile, Colombia, El Salvador, Haiti, Paraguay, uh, and Peru are states that uh, have done so have acceded, have adhered to uh, either conventions uh, in the last uh, 10 years. Once again, reflecting what Dr. Laura says about the progress of international law uh, in uh, our uh, region. Um, this is quite important. I want to point particular to the relevance of a country such as Costa Rica having adopted uh, uh, statelessness determination procedures, as Commissioner Poshak has pointed to a concerning situation affecting Nicaraguans, where Nicaraguans are being uh, arbitrarily uh, deprived of their uh, nationality. Uh, we will mention that in more detail, but I think that uh, it's important to highlight uh, the functionality the uh, attachment or adherence that the procedure that procedures in Costa Rica uh, have to international standards uh, again found uh, in uh, the resolution. We can move on to 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 the next uh, slide, uh, please, Professor. Thank you very much. Some of the issues we wanted to highlight uh, around uh, the resolution uh, uh, per se. I think first of all. 
Uh, and it was really interesting and I think quite important that Commissioner Poshak from uh, um, the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, she pointed, I think, I think her first slide was, uh, uh, in a way, uh, showed us that this resolution emerges uh, from the Commission, but it emerges from a decision taken by states in the Americas to delegate to the Commission a legal mandate to promote and protect human uh, rights. So I think that, um, and Commissioner Poshak made, made different references to a uh, soft law. Uh, I think that uh, when we consider that within a certain organization, a certain context as the OAS, uh, I think that uh, there are resolutions, there are decisions that have normative value uh, in uh, our uh, region. Um, these resolutions, I think the case can be made for resolutions uh, to be binding on the members of that organization that have uh, delegated uh, such a mandate uh, to uh, the commission. And I think that is something that we must not, again, underestimate. And that is something that we must all work together. International organizations, the commission, the academia, uh, engaging with uh, litigators, engaging with uh, judicial uh, authorities, not just the Inter-American Court on Human Rights. I'll make reference to some of its key decisions on this, uh, which have also been uh, incorporated into the uh, uh, resolution, uh, but also when it comes to uh, national uh, domestic uh, courts uh, in a position to uh, what uh, I think uh, those of us who, who, who are not just fans, but who have dedicated our life to international human rights and refugee uh, and stateless uh, statelessness uh, uh, law point to the uh, crystallization of uh, soft law into hard binding normative value uh, 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 laws. So the resolution uh, uh, in that sense contributes to the implementation of treaties. Reading the resolution, you will find there quite a lot of principles, rules that are uh, binding, uh, deriving from uh, existing uh, 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 treaties. You will find some of the uh, executive committee uh, of the UNHCR, uh, not recommendations, sorry, but uh, conclusions on uh, uh, statelessness, other normative uh, instruments, international human rights law in particular, the American uh, Convention on uh, uh, Human Rights, quite a uh, a centerpiece in this legal uh, this this discussion, um, and as I said, including those still regarded as uh, soft law, but uh, pending uh, the joint work, as I as I mentioned, for the crystallization of these uh, norms that are still regarded as uh, a soft law. I think it provides guidance to states in the adoption of domestic legislation, public uh, policies. Um, I think Commissioner Poshak made reference to uh, the situation uh, in uh, countries like Uruguay. Uh, she made reference to a recent audience uh, held uh, by the Commission looking at uh, the situation in Uruguay. She also made reference to the situation in the Caribbean, uh, Bahamas, Barbados, the Dominican uh, uh, Republic. Um, and I think uh, to say, uh, I think uh, uh, we, we must also not uh, look at the resolution uh, alone. Uh, the resolution uh, uh, has a, a, a very substantial interaction with resolution 04 from 2009, uh, uh, where the Inter-American Commission uh, adopted uh, principles and uh, standards also in relation to the right of nationality uh, and uh, uh, statelessness. Um, we can move on, uh, Professor Catherine. Um, here I've mentioned, but I think it's important to highlight that uh, the resolution uh, incorporates 
key aspects of uh, the jurisprudence of the Inter-American Court on Human Rights. I think here you have perhaps what we can refer to as uh, the, the leading cases and a key advisory uh, opinion from the Inter-American on Human Rights uh, pointing to um, different uh, aspects that you will find uh, um, reiterated in the uh, resolution. Bear in mind that uh, uh, the judgments from the Inter-American Commission, they have binding force on, uh, on the state. The advisory opinion also has a normative value vis-a-vis uh, -vis those countries that have recognized the jurisprudence of the Inter-American uh, Court. But besides uh, those uh, cases uh, there, uh, I think uh, there are also um, more recent I mean, uh, sentences. Uh, the case of uh, Mr. Brownstein uh, versus Peru from 2001, uh, the case of uh, Hellman versus Uruguay from 2011, and uh, also a uh, advisory opinion number four from 1984 that uh, also brings us uh, some of the content uh, you will find uh, in the uh, resolution. Uh, we can move on. Uh, I'm afraid I'm already almost uh, without time. Um, here, I just want to point to some uh, not definitive, but uh, not an exhaustive list of, of challenges we continue to face in the region. I think first uh, uh, I, I want to mention uh, concerns over uh, the re-emergence of a practice that uh, we haven't seen in the region, I think, uh, uh, since uh, uh, um, the time of uh, uh, military dictatorships in the context of the Southern Con, which is the arbitrary deprivation of uh, nationality. It is a situation, uh, as you all know, and as Commissioner Poshak mentioned, affecting uh, Nicaraguans. But I hear, I, I think it's important, and, and a point I wanted to make that um, the arbitrary deprivation of uh, nationality in a context where individuals are expelled uh, or forced to flee uh, their uh, home country, um, what in legal terms would be the country of their habitual residence, because these are now stateless individuals, uh, I think that the arbitrary deprivation of nationality from the perspective of international refugee law may or can or should uh, or must be interpreted as a form of persecution, meaning that those individuals left as a stateless are not just stateless. They also bear a well-founded fear of persecution, that persecution being uh, the arbitrary deprivation of nationality. So I think here it's, it is quite a concerning chapter we have in the region where uh, people are not just deemed as, uh, uh, not just left uh, stateless, but they also uh, have international protection uh, also as uh, refugees according to Article 1A of the 1951 Convention relating to uh, refugees. Unfortunately, although uh, progress uh, I've, I've shared with you uh, in the, my first slide, uh, we continue to lack uh, the domestic uh, protection, domestic uh, administrative procedures to determine statelessness, uh, public uh, policy frameworks. Um, I think uh, we remain concerned uh, when it comes to the limited access to naturalization uh, procedures uh, in our region. This is something that I think we continue to work with the legal partners, continue to work with those providing legal aid and assistance along the front lines uh, 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 in the region. They need to expand access to naturalization. They need to expand access to timely and late uh, birth uh, registration. I'll make reference to these in the next uh, slide, mainly for those uh, uh, with special with special needs. Oops, please, please go back, go back, Catherine. Not 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 yet. <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> um, and it's good to know because now I, I thought it was in the next slide, but it is it is right down here. But I, I I've mentioned to you, I mean, uh, timely and late birth registration, and and I just want to 
start finalizing, start finishing by pointing to a situation we have in the region where uh, we continue to face increased forceful displacement, large scale mixed movements. Mixed movements that are just not just mixed, but we also have uh, onward uh, movements. So people, uh, refugees, others in need of international uh, protection, uh, not finding uh, a solution, not finding opportunities uh, to integrate, facing obstacles sometimes to access asylum procedures, facing obstacle to access temporary protection, other type, other legal stay uh, arrangements, uh, moving on. I'm talking about Venezuelans arriving in Colombia, uh, sorry, <laughs> Venezuelans <laughs> arriving in Colombia and then continuing being displaced, moving from Colombia towards Ecuador, Peru, Chile, uh, crossing into the Darien uh, region, uh, borders with uh, Panama and uh, Colombia, continuing throughout a dangerous uh, uh, journey towards uh, the northern parts of uh, North uh, uh, um, America. And uh, as we've seen in countries like Colombia and Chile in particular, uh, people are having serious difficulties for accessing uh, timely or late birth registration and being exposed uh, to a situation of statelessness. We continue to work with Colombian authorities on an initiative, uh, Primero La Infancia. I would quickly translate that into English, perhaps as children uh, first, whereby Colombian authorities have uh, facilitated access to Colombian uh, nationality of uh, children born to Venezuelan uh, parents. Um, most of these parents uh, not having a regular stay a legal status uh, in Colombia. Um, in Chile, we uh, face a, a similar problem. However, the situation in Chile has a, a, an additional element that complicates the situation because those children born of Venezuelan parents presently in Chile were not born in Chile. They were born in Colombia. And they moved towards Chile without having had uh, access to birth uh, registration without having access uh, to any type of uh, documentation issued in uh, what is perhaps their first host country. So I think uh, that situation continues to pose uh, challenges uh, in uh, our region. Uh, there are uh, different initiatives from Colombian authorities, Chilean uh, authorities, we can share with you a recent report that has been published by the law school of a uh, uh, um, university uh, in uh, uh, Chile. Um, and uh, I think uh, that remains a top issue of concern for us uh, in the region. To finish, and I, finally, I, I promise I'll do this quite quickly, Professor, uh, what, what comes uh, next? Uh, yeah, so first of all, disseminating, working together, academia, legal uh, practitioners, the judiciary, executive uh, authorities, disseminating, ensuring observance, ensuring the implementation of uh, the resolution, along with the support of Commissioner uh, Poshak. Commissioner Poshak is also the Inter-American Rapporteur on uh, Human uh, Mobility, therefore a, a, a important mandate uh, for all of us uh, in, in the region. I also wanted to point that uh, last December, we welcome very much uh, a, 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 a multi, uh, um, perhaps a multilateral pledge uh, presented uh, by uh, Mercosur on uh, working uh, towards the establishment, uh, the strengthening of uh, domestic uh, procedures to determine statelessness, uh, disseminating uh, um, good practices on arising from those uh, procedures. So Mercosur is a platform we continue to work with and Commissioner Pashak 
we will be working uh, with you to promote the resolution within the context of uh, uh, Mercosur. We also continue to work quite closely with the network of uh, national uh, civil registries uh, in the region. Uh, Klarsiev, a strong uh, ally uh, in the dissemination of uh, promotion of the uh, resolution. And to finalize, I just want to point, I mentioned to you uh, the Brazil plan of action. Uh, this year we have just started quick started uh, the commemorative process of the 40th anniversary of the uh, 1984 Cartagena Declaration on uh, refugees. Statelessness will be uh, discussed in its first uh, regional uh, consultation scheduled uh, to take place uh, in Mexico, being led by um, the authorities of uh, the Republic of uh, Chile, who are uh, leading uh, the process uh, aimed at um, ending the year with a new declaration and a new plan of action, uh, the plan of action, uh, uh, the Chile plan of action uh, for the next uh, 10 years, where with Commissioner Poshak, we will make sure to disseminate and use uh, the resolution uh, when it comes to its uh, uh, chapter on eradicating statelessness. Thank you very much. I do apologize for over uh, passing the time, but again, uh, thank you, you all for inviting us. Thank you very much, everybody.